If you were given a million pounds, what would you do with them? A question they were always asking us when we were young, one that would start our imagination roaming and set us daydreaming. I had two possible answers. One, to buy a yacht, hire an orchestra and sail around the world with my friends listening to Bach, Schumann and Brahms. The other, to build a village where the Fellahin would follow the way of life that I would like them to. This second wish had deep roots going back to my childhood. I had always had a deep love for the country, but it was a love for an idea, not for something I really knew. The country, the place where the Fellahin lived, I had seen from the windows of the train as we went from Cairo to Alexandria for the summer holidays, but this fleeting experience was supplanted by two contrasting pictures which I had got respectively from my father and my mother. My father avoided the country. To him, it was a place full of flies, mosquitoes and polluted water, and he forbade his children to have anything to do with it. Although he possessed several estates in the country, he would never visit them or go any nearer to the country than Mansura, the provincial capital, where he went once a year to meet his bailiffs and collect his rent. Until my 27th year, I never set foot on any of our country property. My mother had spent part of her childhood in the country of which she preserved the pleasantest memories and to which she longed to return right up to the end of her life. She told us stories of the tame lambs that would follow her about, of all the animals on the farm, the chickens and pigeons, of how she made friends with them and watched them through the year. The only animals we saw close up were the lambs bought for carbon byram, which as soon as we had made friends with them were taken to be killed, or the herds of young cows being driven through the streets to the slaughterhouse. She told us how the people produced everything they needed for themselves in the country, how they never needed to buy anything more than the cloth for their clothes, how even the rushes for their brooms grew along the ditches in the farm. I seemed to inherit my mother's unfulfilled longing to go back to the country, which I thought offered a simpler, happier and less anxious life than the city could. These two pictures combined in my imagination to produce a picture of the country as a paradise, but a paradise darkened from above by clouds of flies and whose streams flowing underfoot had become muddy and infested with vilharsia and dysentery. This image haunted me and made me feel that something should be done to restore to the Egyptian countryside the felicity of paradise. If the problem appeared simple to me at the time, it was because I was young and inexperienced. But it was and is a question that has occupied the greater part of my thoughts and energies ever since. A problem whose unfolding complexity through the years has only reinforced my conviction that something should be done to solve it. Such a something, though, can only work if inspired by love. The people who are to transform the countryside will not be able to do it by large directives issued from office desks in Cairo. They will have to love the fellow enough to live with him, to make their homes in the country and to devote their lives to practical work on the spot towards the improvement of rural life.